Thank you, Ona, and thank you for coming out this morning. It's great to be speaking to you guys uh, again. I think I was here maybe about five years ago talking about my last book, um, Strong Boy. Um, and all my, all my writing has been in, in the history realm. Uh, but then after I finished Strong Boy, I was uh, giving you a sneak preview already, I guess. This is a really trigger happy. Um, when I was uh, looking for my next story to write, I told my agent, all right, I've got this story. It's about a band of uh, refugees from the Great Hunger who come to the United States. They fight in the Civil War and then unite in a private army uh, that undertakes one of the most fantastical missions in military history to kidnap Canada and ransom it for Ireland's independence. <laughs> so her first question to me was, when did you s decide to start writing fiction? And I said, no, this, this is a true story. And then her, her second question was, how many pints of Guinness did you have to, to inspire this idea? Uh, so, but I know the idea sounds just absurd today that, uh, that there was an Irish American army that invaded Canada, but it happened not just once, but five times between 1866 and 1871 in what are collectively known as the Fenian Raids. And so this whole idea sounds absurd to us today, but part of what I want to do is try to transport you back about 160 years and you'll see that this idea is not as crazy as it sounds. So why would anyone want to attack sweet, peaceable, polite Canada, a place where when the buses do get into an accident, they do say, sorry. So that's part of us viewing the past through the lens of today when the United States and Canada share the longest peaceable international boundary in the world. But relations between the United States and Canada were not always so polite. And in fact, in the first American century, the United States had a border problem but it was a northern one. The border between the United States and Canada was a lawless no man's land that was frequented by counterfeiters and smugglers and there was a lot of skirmishes on, over just where this border actually ran. And uh, this, the, the idea of invading Canada in the first hundred years of this country's history was about as American as fireworks on the 4th of July. So even before the Declaration of Independence is signed, the Continental Army goes due north, and General Richard Montgomery will seize Montreal and march on to Quebec City, where he meets up with Colonel Benedict Arnold before he turns traitor, leading another band of the Continental Army up through Maine. And they lose a terrible battle on New Year's Eve in 1775. But the United States will return again during the War of 1812. There are battles being fought on both sides of the border. And before the British ever burned down the White House, it was American troops who burned down the provincial capital of Ontario, which is present-day Toronto. And the village of Buffalo on the other side of the border got burned down. So there's a lot of action back and forth. And then there's these series of ridiculous interactions with equally farcical names that start to take place. So there's the Pork and Beans War of 1838 uh, between a group, a groups of lumberjacks from Maine and New Brunswick who are fighting over the same logging rights. And then my favorite is the Pig War of 1859 uh, that I assure you was no baloney. <laughs> It started when there was an American settler on the disputed island of San Juan Island between Seattle and Vancouver, and he sees a pig that's rustling around in his garden, and he shoots it dead. Turns out the pig belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company of Canada, and let's just say that things really spiral out of control to the point that there are 500 American troops under General George Pickett on one side of the island staring at 2,000 British troops and five warships on the other side of the island. Uh, luckily, no shots were ever fired, and the biggest combat threat of that mission was the complete and utter boredom that was suffered by the soldiers staring at each other. <laughs> So the thing that we also have to remember is that the, um, the, let's do this. There we go. All right. So the flag that's flying over Canada is not the familiar maple leaf that we know today, 
but it is this flag, the Union Jack, which is a hated symbol to these militant Irish Americans who are going to carry out these attacks. So the luck of the Irish was not something that you really wanted to covet for about 700 years because the Irish had the poor fortune of being in the backyard of England and Great Britain, which would become the most powerful empire in the world. And the British colonized Ireland since the, uh, since the 12th century. And things got really bad in the 1700s when uh, the British Parliament passed laws that restricted the rights of the Irish uh, living in Ireland, particularly Irish Catholics. So if you were Irish Catholic living in Ireland in the 1700s, you were not allowed to vote. You were not allowed to hold public office. You could not send your child to a Catholic teacher. You cannot have a Catholic teacher brought into your house to teach your child. You could not own firearms, a horse that was uh, worth more than five pounds. You were allowed to have a knife as long as it was chained to a table so that you could not use it against the local priest, uh, the local police, sorry. I'm, I'm jumping ahead in my mind here. Uh, so even in death, though, your rights were restricted because a Catholic priest could not preside at graveside uh, ceremonies in, in cemeteries in Ireland. So you have then, for 700 years, the Irish thinking that the British are trying to uh, extinguish their language, their religion, their culture. And then when the potato crop starts to fail in the 1840s and 1850s, there is a segment of the Irish who think that the British are trying to exterminate them altogether. So during the Great Hunger, uh, after the failure of the potato crop, uh, you have uh, one million uh, who die. There are two million who are forced to flee the country. And you won't hear too many scholars these days calling it a famine is more referred to as the great hunger. There are a lot of people in Ireland who don't think that this was necessarily a famine because it's, it, a famine connotes that there was a lack of food. Uh, but there were wheat, barley, and oats that were being grown in Ireland and were getting shipped out under armed guard to other ports in the British Empire. So you have many of these two million people who are fleeing the Great Hunger are going to come to North America. Uh, they'll either settle in Canada or in the United States. And the Irish who come to the United States are unlike any newcomers that the country had seen before. Maybe the biggest difference is that they weren't necessarily immigrants coming to this country for American values. They're, they're refugees fleeing a humanitarian disaster. They're not hungering for American ideals, they're literally just starving for food. And then you have about a quarter of them who don't speak the English language, they speak Irish, most of them are, are illiterate, and to many Americans, the Irish who are pouring into this country are practicing an alien religion, Catholicism. So for a country that was, uh, the, whose European settlement was based on the pilgrims and the Puritans who were trying to get away from any vestiges of the Catholic Church, here come just a tidal wave of Irish Catholics into this country. So even in a city like Boston, which in this, at the start of the Great Hunger had a population of 100,000, all of a sudden has 40,000 Irish Catholics just pouring into the city, putting strains on a lot of the existing uh, institutions. So there develops then a backlash. And uh, the, really the height of the backlash is in, 18, in the 1850s with the rise of the Know Nothings. And the peak of the Know Nothing movement was in 1854. Um, that's a year where churches were being burned. There was a priest in Maine who was tarred and feathered. And then there's this strange incident in March of 1854 when a group of know nothing sneak into the construction site for the Washington Monument. They tie up the, uh, the night watchman and then they find a particular block for the monument. They wheel it down to the Potomac River, they sail it out into the river and they dump it overboard. So why did they do this? Well, it was, this particular block was donated by the Pope. And there's a segment of the Know Nothings who think that the uh, Pope is trying to signal an uprising of Catholics in this country to establish a new Vatican in, wait for it, Cincinnati. <laughs> so they re the Know Nothings sweep 
a lot of the elections in the Northeast in 1854, none more than here in Massachusetts, where the Know Nothings win every statewide office and all but three seats in the state legislature. And then they start to go about enacting their program, which included uh, mandating the use of the King James Bible, the Protestant Bible in public schools. They banned the existence of Irish American militias. They launched surprise raids on rectories and convents. And then Massachusetts and New York actually started deporting a lot of the Irish uh, uh, immigrants back to the British Isles. So it's not an understatement to say that the Irish did not assimilate very easily into the United States. And you have England that long talked about the Irish problem. And of course, the problem with the Irish, according to the English, were they weren't English. So they tried for 700 years to try to anglicize them and recast them into their own images. But the Irish, were they resisted. They resisted any, um, any, any attempts to try to dilute their culture. So they may have been subjugated, but they were never <coughs> conquered. And when the Irish come to the United States and face this similar discrimination, they react like they, they implement the same survival mechanism that worked for them for seven centuries, and they turn inward, uh, sort of like a snake that coils itself for protection. So they start to cling together in church parishes and fraternal organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And then in 1858, they start to join a new organization that is called the Fenian Brotherhood. And the Fenian Brotherhood is the brainchild of these two men. On the left is James Stevens, on the right is John O'Mahony. And these men both were participants and leaders in the attempted revolution, the Young Ireland Rebellion in 1848, when they attempted to uh, launch a revolution inside Ireland. Uh, the timing was just terribly poor. Uh, Ireland is just trying to survive its uh, way through the great hunger and really doesn't have the strength to launch a revolution. So there is a shootout though during this uh, attempted revolution and James Stevens is badly wounded and thought to be on his way to death. So the uh, Irish, uh, British uh, forces and Irish police just leave James Stevens lying on the side of the road assuming that he's dead. James Stevens, though, survives and then pulls sort of a page out of Mark Twain's playbook and fakes his own death. So he has an, an obituary that runs in the local Kilkenny newspaper. His father carries a coffin full of rocks that he buries in a local cemetery. And the British authorities think that James Stevens is dead, but all the while he is on the lam. He manages to evade capture for a couple months through the mountains of Ireland disguises himself, travels to England, uh, actually spends a night right across the street from Buckingham Palace under the nose of Queen Victoria, and then uh, makes his way to safety in Paris. And John O'Mahony will make a similar escape to Paris, and they will live there together for a few years. And then by the late 1850s, um, the pair think that maybe it's time to try another revolution in Ireland again. So by this point, John O'Mahony has now moved to the second most Irish city in the world, which is New York City. <laughs> and on St. Patrick's Day in 1858 in Dublin, James Stevens will found an organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Later that year, at a ceremony in New York's Tammany Hall, John O'Mahony will form a sister organization called the Fenian Brotherhood. And this is really the first transatlantic revolutionary framework that is ever established to try to, to uh, get the freedom for Ireland. And the basic idea is that um, with their freedoms in America, uh, the Fenian Brotherhood is going to raise money and raise arms, and they will send them across the ocean to Ireland where James Stevens and the IRB will work on uh, amassing the army for the next revolution in Ireland. Now, if you became a member of the Fenian Brotherhood, you had to take an oath. It was a secret society in its initial years. And this caused the organization to run afoul of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church forbid any members from taking secret oaths, uh, and, that, and if, if, that is why uh, 
Fenians could then be denied uh, the sacraments by the Catholic Church, uh, they could be denied communion, and even after the organization is no longer a secret organization, the Catholic Church still kept its stance against the Fenians. So by 1871, well after it's no longer a secret society, the Pope actually issues an edict that any members of the Fenian Brotherhood would be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. So the movement is moving ahead with this plan of invading Ireland uh, three years in the making when then the Civil War breaks out. And there is a scholar by the name of Damien Shields in Ireland who's done a lot of research into the Irish, Native Irish who served in the Civil War. By his estimates, approximately 2,000 Irish-born soldiers fought for the Union cause and about 20,000 for the Confederacy. And who you fought for was mostly just down to geography, where you happen to have uh, come to America and made a new life. The uh, Irish who are fighting for the Union cause, uh, they are not enlisting in such numbers because they want to liberate the slaves. Uh, they're doing it to prove their patriotism, to the know-nothings. For many of them who are still on the bottom of the economic ladder, they're enlisting just to get the soldier's salary. They don't expect that the war is going to last too long, so they'll sign up for maybe three to six months and, and then get some pay. And then there's this militant, more militant group of Fedians who thinks that the Civil War is a training ground for the real war that they want to fight, which is going to be the revolution against Britain. So they will learn battlefield tactics and, and the use of weaponry, and they'll be able to take that to the cause uh, for the revolution in Ireland. So as the war progresses, of course, it lasts a lot longer than anyone thinks, and it's these Irish who end up getting, um, uh, getting killed by, by the thousands. They're, they're cannon fodder in battles at Antietam and Bull Run and Fredericksburg. And as the war progresses, it's, it's interesting that the Union Army actually makes some uh, provisions for Union Army members who are part of the Fenian Brotherhood. So Fenian recruiters would actually go to these into Union Army camps and try to recruit members. And then by the fall of 1863, when the Fenian Brotherhood has its first annual convention in Chicago, the federal government actually gives Fenian members a pass to leave the front lines to go travel to Chicago. And by the end of the Civil War, the organization is really gaining momentum and it will have tens of thousands of members. And the Fenian Brotherhood will actually then start to have paid recruiters who will go to the mill cities in Massachusetts. So they'll go to Lawrence one night, Lowell the next night to recruit members. They'll go to the, uh, the mining towns out in Pennsylvania, a different village each night, and they're signing up members by the thousands there. And the Fenian Brotherhood actually then has its own, uh, has its own president, has its own Senate, it has its own constitution, it has its own government in exile. It's the, it establishes the Irish Republic in exile, and it has this Capitol building right in the heart of New York City, a place called the Moffat Mansion. The press would, would refer to it as the Fenian White House, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a four-story brownstone on the north side of Union Square. And you can see the flags flying over it. You have the stars and stripes, but then there's also the Irish flag. So again, Here's a whole government in exile plotting revolution against the British in the heart of New York City. And keep in mind that the Catholic Church is still banning them because they're supposedly a secret organization. Uh, the other thing that we'll see too is that the, um, the interesting thing about uh, the Fenians being called a secret organization is that the worst thing that they were at doing is keeping a secret. Uh, so they were easily infiltrated by American spies, British spies, Canadian spies. Uh, but in truth, all uh, anyone wanted to know about what the Fenians were doing was to just have a newspaper subscription because it's all uh, out in their, their, their every move. So in addition to having their own uh, Republican exile, they issue their own war bonds in denominations from $10 to $500. So you could purchase these bonds and then they would be payable six months after the establishment of the Irish Republic with interest. Now, the interesting thing about this is when the Irish Republic is finally established decades later, all of a sudden these bonds come out of people's drawers in America, knocking on the doors of the government in Dublin wanting to get paid off 
And the government in Dublin had no idea what these bonds were all about. They didn't pay anything out on them, but uh, they could still fetch a pretty penny today um, on, on eBay. So, so by the fall of 1865, everything's in place to try to launch this revolution in Ireland. And uh, you start to have Civil War veterans who start to sneak into Ireland to get into position for the uprising. But as I said, Fenian uh, business was very easy for the British to know what was going on. And the British decide to crack down. So they arrest the Fenian leaders. James Stevens is forced into hiding again. Uh, habeas corpus is suspended in Ireland. And the, this idea of having the revolution in Ireland is all but dead at, at this point um, for the time being. And this is going on at the same time that there's a growing movement of Fenians who think this whole idea of trying to launch a revolution in Ireland is a crazy idea because we've tried it every generation, it hasn't worked. How are we going to get all these guns over to Ireland? Not only do we not have a navy, we don't even have a single boat. So there's a group that says, why are we doing all this logistical work when we can literally just get on a train and walk across the border into British soil and that is in Canada. So this idea is really gaining steam and then particularly after the idea of the revolution in Ireland is, um, is dead for the time being. So what's the idea? What are they hoping to get by attacking Canada? Well, one idea is that maybe what they can do is they can divert British troops from Ireland to Canada that will leave uh, Ireland less defended and more capable of being conquered by the skeleton crew that of Fenians that are still in Ireland. Another idea is that they will just get over the Canadian territory get a little bit of territory for themselves, and then they will be able to um, gain belligerent rights and issue letters of marquee to privateers that could then terrorize British shipping. Then a third idea is that what they can do is maybe what will happen is we can spark a war between the United States and Great Britain. And if we help out the United States, conquer Canada, then the United States in return will give us Ireland. And then there's just this real militant group of Fenians who think that we can get into Canada, we'll be able to conquer it, and then we're just going to simply hold it hostage until the British give us Ireland and then we will give Canada back. And the most surprising thing to me in doing the research in this book is that this idea actually had the tacit support of the White House. So after the war, the Fenians are among the primary buyers of all these surplus weapons and surplus ammunition that is available after the end of the Civil War. And then there's a meeting in the White House in October of 1865 between Fenian leaders and President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward. And according to the Fenians, and they're the only account that we have of this, so we have to just keep that in mind. Uh, at the meeting, they detailed the idea of attacking Canada. And Johnson said that he basically would turn a blind eye to them. He, quote, he would, quote, acknowledge accomplished facts, which they took to mean that if you get into Canada and you have to get some territory, okay, then we'll deal with it at that point. But I'm not going to do anything to actively stop you. So why would Johnson take that point of view when uh, conducting a war against another country with it, the United States is at peace is a violation of neutrality laws? That is because of the tremendous hostility between the United States and Great Britain by the end of the Civil War. So you may have heard of the Trent Affair in, in uh, early on in the Civil War when a uh, American ship stopped a British steamer and pulled two Confederate diplomats off of it. That almost triggered a war between the British and Americans in 1861. Um, but what really angered the Americans was that it was inside British ports that uh, were built great warships, um, Confederate warships like this one, the CSS Alabama, that terrorized Union shipping for a couple of years all over the globe. Uh, it was said that British hands not only built these ships, but there were British sailors on board who were faking southern accents as well. <laughs> British, uh, it was inside British foundries that Confederate guns were being manufactured. So by the end of the war, 
Andrew Johnson wants the British to pay reparations for all the damage that is caused by their warships. He wants millions and millions of dollars in, in damages. And then there's a lot of animosity towards Canada itself over what happens during the, um, during the Civil War. Because Canada is a haven for draft dodgers and escaped Confederate prisoners of war. And it's also a place where the Confederate Secret Service had a um, had safe haven. And from Canada, they plotted raids on a bank in St. Albans, Vermont, in which they were able to get a few hundred thousand dollars. There was uh, a plot to firebomb public spaces and theaters in New York City that they attempted to carry out in November 1864, but um, their Greek fire did not ignite in the way that it was supposed to. And then there's a thought that this, uh, this Confederate Secret Service cell in Canada was involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln because John Wilkes Booth was spotted by some eyewitnesses in Montreal the day before the, the assassination. And then when Booth is killed, there's a slip from the Royal Ontario Bank that is found in his possession. So there's a lot of animosity towards Great Britain, a lot of animosity towards Canada. And then there's still this idea of manifest destiny at hold in the United States. So now that the country has reunited, it stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific, territory has been taken from Mexico, What's the next place that the United States is going to expand to? Well, due north in Canada. So there, is, uh, there are bills that are introduced to Congress in 1866 that actually apportions out where the four new states from Canada are going to be to enter into the Union and where those, the 29 new congressmen are going to be apportioned among those four states. And then there's this plan by a senator named Zach Chandler in Michigan that has 30 other senators that sign off on it. And the plan is that as a way to heal the nation after the Civil War, uh, the country will put together a 200,000 man army with 100,000 men from the north and 100,000 men from the south. And this army is going to invade Canada and hold it hostage until the British repay the, rep pay the reparations that they want due for uh, the, the Alabama claims. So here come the Fenians into Andrew Johnson's office with pretty much the same plan. So. Why not outsource the job to the Irish for them to do? So that's why you have this, uh, the White House turning a blind eye to this whole operation. So let's talk about the, the, the first major attack on Canada, and it's the brainchild of this man, Thomas William Sweeney, who is the epitome of the fighting Irish. So when Thomas Sweeney uh, emigrated, to, uh, emigrated from Ireland to America when he was a boy of 11 years old, uh, he is actually washed overboard in the Atlantic Ocean and survives 30 minutes in the cold Atlantic until he is rescued. He makes it safely to America. He will later enlist in the military and fight in the Mexican-American War. And in one battle, uh, he is shot in the groin, decides he's going to keep fighting, and then minutes later takes another bullet that goes right through his right arm, which will lead to its amputation. But rather than leaving the military, he keeps serving. In fact, he's able to, he gets into a fist fight with his superior officer, but it still whips him with his one good arm. And then during the Civil War, the Battle of Shiloh, he's very instrumental in, in the Union cause there, despite taking two more gunshots to his left arm and another one to his leg. But after the Civil War, he then signs up to be the Secretary of War for the Fenian Brotherhood to put together this plan of attacking Canada. And he has thought his military service in defense of the Union, like many of the other Fenians, was a, really just a prelude to this cause of, of uh, fighting for Ireland's independence. So let's talk about the plan itself that Sweeney comes up with. So it is an amphibious invasion uh, with five prongs. And to the west, uh, he's going to get some boats ready in Chicago, and there'll be a band of Irish who sail up through Lake Michigan and Huron and land in Ontario. There'll be another group that crosses the Detroit River uh, into Windsor, Ontario. Another amphibious landing will be launched from Cleveland across uh, Lake Erie. Another band will cross from Buffalo uh, into the Niagara Peninsula. And these Four prongs will then converge and march on Toronto. But according to Sweeney's plan, this is all a feint. He wants this to be um, a false move that he hopes is going to draw the British and Canadian Defence Forces away from Montreal, 
which is his true target. Because he, he wants an army of 17,000 men to go right up through the Lake Champlain Valley in Vermont, seize Montreal, seize Quebec City, and then they're in control of the St. Lawrence River, which will allow them to put a chokehold on all trade going in and out of Canada. So it's a, it's a playbook that had been tried before uh, by the Continental Army, tried by uh, the American forces in the War of 1812 without much success. Uh, during the War of 1812, uh, it was uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote that conquering Canada was going to be a mere matter of marching. Uh, they assumed that, they, that Americans would be treated as liberators by the Canadians who they assumed would want to join uh, in casting off the British and join the United States. And there's false assumptions that uh, the French speakers in Quebec would want to get rid of the British and join the United States. And this idea is baked into uh, Sweeney's plan again. The idea is that once the Canadians, uh, once the Irish uh, American army crosses into Canada, they will get the support of all the French speakers in Quebec. They will get the support of all the Irish immigrants in Canada who are in the hundreds of thousands. And they also expect that the Irish in the United States will rise up and flock to the border to try to join this army as it marches onward into Canada. So this whole idea of attacking Canada sounds like a great idea to this man. He is John O'Neill. He is the central character in When the Irish Invaded Canada. He is going to be present in each one of these five uh, invasions. His hand will be uh, behind these invasions. And John O'Neill was born in County Monaghan in the north of Ireland. Uh, he saw firsthand the horrors of the Great Hunger, what it did to his family farm. He saw his local town lose 20% of its population. And he learned as a young boy, he listened to tales of his grandfather about uh, famous ancestors of the O'Neill clan, men like Hugh O'Neill and Owen Roe O'Neill, who dared to stand up to the British and fight the forces of Queen Elizabeth. And although they were not successful in casting the British off from Ireland, John O'Neill learns that just by standing up and making a fight will make you a hero among the Irish. He comes to the United States when he's about 10 years old, and he saw the logic in attacking the British Empire at its closest point instead of an ocean away in Ireland. And he wrote this, that Canada is a province of Great Britain, the English flag floats over it, and English soldiers protect it. Wherever the English flag and English soldiers are found, Irishmen have a right to attack. So when he receives a telegram at his uh, home in Nashville, Tennessee, he kisses his wife goodbye, says so long to his two-month-old son, and leaves his business that's worth $50,000 to go off and fight in Canada. So when he gets to Cleveland, which was his initial destination, he finds out what Sweeney is starting to find out, and as the plan is starting to fall apart even before it can start. The men are not showing up in as many numbers as thought, the boats cannot be located in Chicago, and they're trying to figure out what's going on here, and part of the problem is this secret organization, once again, all the news is fit the print of what's going on inside the Fenian Brotherhood. So every newspaper across the country is covering the impending Fenian War. So the authorities know what's going on, um, and the Irish are not showing up in the numbers that they should, so Sweeney decides what he's going to do is he's just going to put as many men into Buffalo, New York as he can get. So John O'Neill is ordered to go to Buffalo, and there's about 800 uh, men in an Irish American army that comes out uh, onto the streets of Buffalo on the night of May 31st, 1866. And John O'Neill happens to be in the right place at the right time because he is the highest ranking person that anyone could find. So John O'Neill is given the command of the Irish army. And for O'Neill, his whole life has been leading to this moment because he wrote, the governing passion of my life, apart from my duty to my God, is to be at the head of an Irish army battling against England for Ireland's rights. For this I live, and for this, if necessary, I'm willing to die. So O'Neill leads this army through the streets of Buffalo 
um, late on the night of May 31st, 1866. And even though there's been all this talk about a pending Feeney invasion, there are actually no Canadian defense forces on the other side of the Niagara River from Buffalo. And that's because there have been rumors of these attacks for months and months, and it had become like the boy who cries wolf to the point that no one wanted to pay to put the militia out anymore. They would just wait and see if this thing actually happened, and then they would deal with the problem at that point. So the only thing that is standing between the Fenian army and Canada is one United States warship that is in port in Buffalo, and that's the USS Michigan. So when uh, Captain Andrew Bryson of the USS Michigan hears about a disturbance of men marching through Buffalo, uh, he orders his ship to be put out into the Niagara River to monitor it. And uh, he can only get the ship out there with the help of his pilot, who's the only man who knows to, to uh, navigate the Niagara River. So Bryson knows that, but so does the Fenian Brotherhood, which has a sleeper cell on this ship. So there are 17 members, uh, 17 crew of the USS Michigan who are members of the Fenian Brotherhood. And they know what they have to do is they have to take the pilot out. Out for a night on the town of Buffalo, New York. So the pilot, whose name is Patrick Murphy, is, and he's no Fenian, however, he is a loyal sailor, they take Patrick Murphy into the saloons of Buffalo so that when Bryson is looking for his pilot, reportedly Murphy is stumbling around the streets of Buffalo singing the wearing of the green. <laughs> so the coast is clear for John O'Neill's army to cross the Niagara River and they do so in the early morning hours of June 1st, and then they uh, plant their feet on British soil and they plant their Irish flags in the same turf. So here's a, sort of a showing of what the troop movements are for this, uh, this invasion, and the blue line will be the movement of the Fenian troops, and the red line will be the movement of the British and the Canadian troops. So John O'Neill is on uh, the Niagara Peninsula for more than 24 hours before he will counter any defense forces. So he is on the morning of June 2nd uh, in the village of Ridgeway, He's positioned on top of a limestone ridge, and uh, this is about 20 miles south of Niagara Falls. And he can see coming his way uh, an army made up of British uh, troops and Canadian militiamen, and he sees that the size of this army is about three times the size of his troops. He does, however, have the advantage of having much more experienced troops because he's got Civil War veterans uh, who have been fighting and for, for years. And uh, the Canadian Defense Forces, some of them are farmers who have never fired a gun in their lives. There's a regiment that is made up of students from the University of Toronto. Uh, they got a knock on the door uh, the night before the Feeney invasion and said, we have good news for you. You no longer have to study for your finals tomorrow. <laughs> the bad news is you need to be at the drill shed in downtown Toronto at 5 a.m. tomorrow to grab a gun to, um, to fight the southern invasion. So, um, so a battle starts to take place on the morning of June 2nd at the Battle of Ridgeway, and um, this was memorialized in, in this lithograph here. And I can tell you that there is pretty much little here that's actually historical uh, in the lithograph. So first of all, they're not fighting just feet apart like you would expect at uh, reenactment in Lexington and Concord, okay? Um, it's a much more chaotic battlefield. They're fighting in the middle of an apple orchard. There's split rail fences. Um, men are hiding behind the trees while they're, while they're trying to fire. And then let's talk about what the troops are wearing here. So for one thing, the Irish are not wearing all green uniforms. They're wearing a real hodgepodge. You have men who are dressed in their Union blues. You have Confederates in their grays. There's a regiment of Louisiana Tigers who had come from as far away as New Orleans, and they're, and they're still wearing their Confederate uniforms. Many of the men are just dressed in their civilian clothes. Uh, on the opposite side, you would have some British troops who are wearing red, but the Canadian militiamen, I will show you in this next watercolor, which is 
accurate. It was done by an eyewitness of, on the scene. And this is what the Canadian forces were wearing. They're the ones in the green uniforms out there on the battlefield, okay? And this is a much more accurate representation of what the battlefield itself looked like. So with their overwhelming numbers, uh, the Canadian and British forces were getting the real early advantage in this fight. And John O'Neill decides that he's going to do a maneuver that he can only do with a, an experienced army, and that is he orders all his men to fall back uh, into a false retreat. And the Canadian British forces start getting overconfident, start stretching their lines, and then when John O'Neill thinks the moment is right, he all of a sudden appears on top of this limestone ridge riding a horse and gives the order for his men to charge. The inexperienced Canadian commander sees John O'Neill on his horse and thinks a whole cavalry charge is coming his way. So he follows what he learned in the textbook, he had never fought in a battle before, and he puts his men into a square. What happens then is that makes his men sitting ducks because they're not facing a cavalry, they're facing an infantry. And uh, it doesn't take long for the Fenians to start to rout the Canadian and British forces who then eventually uh, start to run for their lives and throw down their weapons and are just trying to have any sort of escape that they can. And John O'Neill has scored the first victory by an Irish army over the forces of the British Empire since 1745. And John O'Neill would become one of the most famous Irish Americans of his day because of that. He would forever be known as the hero of Ridgeway. But after the battle, John O'Neill is wondering where are all his reinforcements? Where are all the Irish from the United States who were going to be crossing from Buffalo and, and helping out once they heard that they had gone across into Canadian territory? He wants to know where all the Irish who were living in Canada were. He assumed they were all going to rise up and assist them in, in this fight. So he has to circle back to their landing spot to see what was going on. And as he does so, uh, there's another shootout in the village of Fort Erie, and uh, it's literally house-to-house -house combat. Once again, O'Neill is going to emerge victorious in this battle, but he looks out onto Niagara River and he sees what has happened. There are now American warships out there that have blocked uh, any crossing from Buffalo into Canada, and John O'Neill and the Fenian Army thinks that they've now been double-crossed by President Andrew Johnson. So O'Neill knows that he has no choice. He has to order a retreat of his men back to the United States. And in their crossing, Captain Bryson on the USS Michigan will get his revenge because he orders everyone arrested. So he puts the Fenian army on a scow that is tied to the back of the USS Michigan. They are out there and exposed to the elements for two days while President Johnson dithers trying to figure out what to do with all these men who broke the law. Eventually they would be released, but the Fenian leaders such as John O'Neill would be forced to stand trial. So they went to a courtroom in Buffalo, they posted bail, and they were let out with the assistance of a local Buffalo lawyer named Grover Cleveland, <laughs> who would become President of the United States uh, a, a few decades later. Uh, so O'Neill is ready to face trial, but he has, has a better fate than about 100 of the Fenians who have been captured um, while crossing into Canada. They will eventually be tried, convicted, and then put on death row to face a hanging. So, all this, and I've got you only about 100 of the 300 pages into the book, okay? <laughs> so, um, I will tell you that before John O'Neill leaves Canadian territory, he lines up all the prisoners that they had taken, and the Canadian prisoners figured that they are about ready to face the firing squad. But instead, John O'Neill will go down one by one, shake the hand of each man, and then in his best uh, foreshadowing of General Douglas MacArthur vows that he will return to Canada sometime soon, but with a bigger army. And John O'Neill will be true to his word because he comes back to Canada in 1870 and 1871, sometimes with very, very, very farcical uh, results. So um, I will give you the spoiler alert, though. Um, this plan of holding Canada hostage and ransoming it for Ireland's independence did not work. <laughs> so, so what's the legacy uh, of, of the Fenians? Well, one is that they did bring self-government to a part of the British Empire, just not the one that they were intending to. So after 
the, this Fenian raid in 1866, there's a, it gives a great impetus to this growing movement inside Canada to form the Confederation of Canada to take over some self-government because a lot of Canadians did not think the British were doing a great job of protecting their southern border. So, uh, in, on July 1st, 1867, the new Canadian Parliament uh, takes power in Ottawa. It's a, a, a self-governing parliament, and Ottawa is cho chosen not a big city like Montreal or Toronto because it was far enough away from the American border to protect it from another American invasion because these are happening just so frequently in Canadian history. Um, for Ireland itself, though, the Fenians, this, this transatlantic framework that they set up with raising money and arms in America and manpower in Ireland would be put into operation and succeed decades later during the Easter Rising um, in 1916. Uh, the money and guns for the operation, a lot of it was raised here in America. And when the Irish Proclamation is read outside the General Post Office in Dublin, very prominent is a mention of Ireland's exiled children in America uh, as a nod to how important they are in this operation. And the Easter Rising would then eventually lead to Ireland gaining, uh, becoming the Irish Free State, and then would become the Irish Republic. So these Fenians took the torch of revolution uh, from the Young Ireland movement in 1848. They managed to keep it alive so they could pass it off to a, a future generation um, that would eventually find success. So I think that's ultimately what um, part of the lesson here is. And you know, we uh, we read a lot of stories and watch a lot of movies about men who face and women who face overwhelming odds. And usually there's a Hollywood ending after it. Well, that's not always the case in, in history. Sometimes you face overwhelming odds and you are not going to win. But the lesson is from the Fenians, that doesn't mean that you don't put up a fight when you think it's necessary. You don't, so whether it's the fight for civil rights or a fight against cancer, just because you're not going to see the fruits of those labors necessarily in your lifetime doesn't mean that you don't put up that fight so that one of your descendants might be able to see that success somewhere um, down the line. So I think, I think that's uh, the lesson uh, also. So um, as I want to mention afterwards, I, I have copies of the book for sale up here. I also have a um, sign-up sheet for, I do a monthly newsletter with a lot of great history stories. Uh, you can also sign up on my website, uh, ChristopherKlein.com, where you can find more about my books. and. Uh, about uh, some of the other writings that I do, a lot of uh, other history um, stories that I tell. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.